74 years ago, four identical black quadruplets were born around 1 a.m. in the basement of Annie Penn Hospital, and this was on May 23, 1946, in Reedsville, North Carolina. In the basement was the emergency room, the cafeteria, and the rooms for black patients. All of the babies were delivered within 13 minutes by Dr. Fred Klenner and a nurse named Margaret Ware. Their parents were James, Pete, and Annie Mae Troxler Fultz. Their mother was 36 and their father was 54 and a sharecropper. When their mother Annie Mae was four, she had spinal meningitis and she lost her hearing and her ability to talk. She attended a school for the deaf and the blind in Raleigh and she communicated through gestures and by reading lips. The hospital didn't have incubators, so the babies were wrapped in blankets and placed close to each other for warmth. Doctors gave them a 50% chance of survival, and Dr. Klenner said that if they lived at least 10 days, they had a chance of having a normal life. During 1939 through 1943, black women gave birth to seven times more quads, 74% more triplets, and 25% more twins. The Fultz quads were the first black identical quads to survive until adulthood, and very soon they would become little celebrities. Prior to their births, only six other sets of identical black quads had been recorded in the United States, but none of them lived past 48 hours. Pete and Annie Mae already had six children. They had four boys and two girls, so you can imagine their surprise when they learned that they were having multiple babies. Before the babies were born, according to x-rays, Annie was only having three babies. When their father heard about this, he started pacing back and forth because he had two brothers and they had 15 children each. When the babies were born, their father Pete was at home sleeping when his children woke him up to tell him the news. He said, I never heard of so many babies in all my life, and then he fell back on the bed and fainted. The girls came to be known as the Reedsville Quads, the Fultz Sisters, or the Fultz Quads. I grew up knowing them as the Fultz Quads because I have two aunts that went to school with them, and their story always fascinated me. I remember seeing them in her yearbook and how pretty they were, and that it was just so neat that they were quadruplets. Dr. Klenner was interesting, to say the least. His practice had separate waiting rooms for blacks and whites well into the 1980s. His very strange son, Fritz, would eventually become part of a deadly duo in North Carolina's 1985 bitter blood case, and I have a video on my channel about it. It didn't take Dr. Klenner long to realize how the babies could benefit him. He began testing his theories about vitamin C on them the day they were born, injecting them each with 50 milligrams. They became his little vitamin C babies. He also experimented on their mother, giving her high doses of vitamin C later in her pregnancy. The names their mother Annie came up with originally were Betty, Clara, Billy, and Anne. But Dr. Klenner took it upon himself to name the girls. He named all of them Mary, followed by the names of the women in his family. There was Anne for his wife, Louise, his daughter, Alice, his aunt, and Catherine, his great aunt. And Annie agreed to the names because it was a different time. Once the babies were healthy enough to be discharged, he set up visitations at their home for strangers to come and gawk at them. They were put on display in a glass-enclosed nursery, and he told the public that visitors were welcome to the home between 2 and 4 p.m. every afternoon. Because the parents couldn't read or write, Dr. Klenner took advantage of them and started looking into the milk industry to find a sponsor for the babies. Dr. Klenner chose pet milk and they negotiated an agreement with Dr. Klenner. And at the time, baby formula companies wanted to use the quads to market to black families since they didn't typically buy formula during the late 40s, usually because of the price. Immediately, the babies were taken off of breast milk and fed their product. And after Dr. Klenner completed the deal, he told the parents. And they were hesitant at first, but accepted the offer because they saw it as an opportunity to make a better life for their family. Now keep in mind, it was Dr. Klenner, not the parents, that signed the contract. For 18 years, the company compensated their parents with four sets of identical clothing, medical care, a nurse, food for the girls, a house, and a farm that it turns out nothing would even grow on. The new house had four rooms in which 13 to 14 people and the nurse had to live. They finally had electricity, a gas hot plate for cooking, and the front porch was closed off so that the nurse had a place to sleep. Just before the girls turned one, they were invited to attend a music festival at Bennett College in Greensboro, North Carolina. They were expected to have around 12,000 visitors, and while they were at Bennett, they were awarded a scholarship for their future education. 
on their second birthday. Their father said the four girls had made him one of the most famous fathers of modern times and that they were as happy as pigs in the sunshine and just about as healthy. On October 17, 1949, ads in black publications started appearing that mentioned the girls' excellent health. And Pet also made calendars, posters, and flyers that were seen all over America. They sold more cans in 1950, four years after the girls were born, than in their entire 65-year history. Over half a century later, baby formula is a $70 billion industry, and black mothers have the lowest breastfeeding rates in the country. The Quad's fifth birthday party was even broadcasted on TV, and they became national icons of the post-war baby boom. The advertising contract had brought in around $350 a month, which was barely enough to keep them off of welfare. And out of that $350, a portion of that had to go to the nurse's salary. So despite their notoriety, their parents still couldn't properly afford to care for 11 children. Plus, they were getting on in year. So in 1952, the girls were legally adopted by their nurse, Elma, and her husband, Charles, who had lost a child to polio. Elma was a piano player, so she taught the girls how to sing and how to perform, and they also took dance lessons. The girls would eventually enroll in Caswell County Training School in Yanceyville, North Carolina, which was the school for black students. And an agreement was reached with the Caswell County Board of Education and Pet Milk that transportation would be provided from their home in Reedsville. Mary Catherine and Mary Ann liked spelling, while Mary Alice and Mary Louise preferred reading and art. When they turned eight, they enjoyed being on stage and performing. In December of 1959, they rode on a float in the 27th Orange Blossom Classic Parade in Miami, Florida, and they were also presented with the keys to the city. On May the 23rd, 1962, the quads were now 16, and in honor of their sweet 16, Pet had autographed photos of the girls available for anyone that wanted a copy. Later on in August of that same year, they met President JFK in the White House garden, and later they got to meet Althea Gibson, the tennis player, and boxer Floyd Patterson. In 1965, the girls graduated from high school and they started college at Bethune-Cookman in Daytona Beach, Florida. They formed their own string quartet and they gave several concerts. Mary Louise and Mary Catherine played the violin, Mary Ann played the viola, and Mary Alice played the cello. They dressed alike in high school and they even wore identical prom dresses. They also ordered the same thing at restaurants. But after two years at Bethune-Cookman, they were unable to adjust to campus life and they were advised to leave school. So the girls, along with Elma and Charles, they moved to Peekskill, New York. Having to leave school really put the girls in a state of depression for quite a while. While in Peekskill, they rarely made any friends, they didn't allow photos or interviews, and they attempted to get past disappointments. In 1966, they were invited to be guests at the Daytona Firecracker 400 by the only black NASCAR stock driver in America, Wendell Scott. While the Fultz squads had made a lot of money for both Pet and Dr. Klenner, they themselves were broke, and as they got older, the public lost interest, and so did Pet Milk. In the November 1968 edition of Ebony Magazine, Charles L. Sanders wrote an article titled, The Fault Squads, Grown Up, Disappointed, and Bitter. In the article, Elma said they desperately wanted people to believe that everything was alright, and that they didn't have any more problems than the average family did. A lot of people saw the Fault Squads as the black version of the Dion Quintuplets from Canada, but behind closed doors, the Dion Quintuplets received $1 million in a trust fund when they were seven, while the Quads were paid scraps. But the Quintuplet story also has a sad ending. In 71, the Quads were in New York and were attending the Barbizon Modeling School with plans to pursue careers in music and modeling. Unfortunately, their dreams of having successful and profitable careers just didn't pan out. They eventually went their separate ways and worked as aides in nursing homes in New York. When they did come together, they'd get into arguments because they were so much alike. They had the same voice, the same expressions, and they got on each other's nerves. In 2002, Alice was near the end of a long 20-year battle with breast cancer. She'd lived with it the longest, but all four quads would eventually be diagnosed with breast cancer. The first to pass was Louise in 1991 and then Anne in 1995. She was diagnosed the same week that Catherine went in for a mastectomy. As Catherine was sitting beside Alice's hospital bed in one of their last conversations, 
Alice made Catherine promise her one thing, that she'd find her son. In 1961, the girls were working in Greensboro at the Skylight Cafe as they did every summer. They waited tables and they also worked at the Thacker family's restaurant and they sometimes stayed in their home. At 15, Catherine was the first to notice a change in Alice. She was eating everything in sight. Catherine said, one day I turned to my back for a minute and she ate my sandwich. I looked at her and whispered, are you pregnant? The girls weren't allowed to date until they were 18, and because the quads had a wholesome good girl image, something had to be done quickly and quietly. So Alice went to Chicago to have her baby. Their adoptive mother found out about Alice's plan, so she followed her to Chicago. When Alice came back to Greensboro with her baby boy, Catherine said that she looked different. She had on red lipstick and her fingernails were painted red. One day, while the baby was asleep in his bassinet, the sisters heard Elma and Lucy Thacker talking in the kitchen. Catherine said that's when the sneaky stuff started. One day, a couple from Winston-Salem came to Thacker's house to see the baby. The next thing Alice knew, they were leaving with him. Alice went crazy and she tried to grab the baby. And after that, Alice would just cry every night. Her heart was broken. And Catherine and Louise also stopped at one because they were concerned about passing on their multiple birth trait. When Louise died in 1991, she had a six-year-old and she was content in her second marriage. Anne suffered years of domestic abuse and after Catherine separated from her husband, she had a child by another man who already had a family. And her adoptive mother, Elma, wanted Catherine to put the baby up for adoption, but she decided against it. Her daughter was named Tasha. However, it was Elma who mostly raised Tasha until she was a teenager because Catherine wasn't around much. And Tasha believes that the only thing that her mother's childhood fame got her was a legacy of broken promises. Tasha tried to get closer to her mother and she would visit her occasionally. She would also send her photos of her children. In 1989, the death of their mother, Annie Mae, brought them back together. And after that, they were never far apart. Once the quads reached their early 40s, it was as if they sensed there wasn't much time left together. They were right, because unfortunately, within two years, Louise was dead from breast cancer. Anne died in 1995, and Alice died in 2001. Tasha said looking at them in the casket was like looking down and seeing your own mother. From her mother Catherine's point of view, it was like looking at yourself. In 1992, Mary Catherine Fultz Griffin, the only surviving sibling, moved back home to Reedsville. In 2002, a journalist observed Catherine as she came across some memorabilia from their pet ad campaigns. They found memorabilia at flea markets and in the windows of old bookstores just all scattered and out of order. And Catherine said, we all came into this world together. I was the last one born because I was hiding behind Alice's back. Now, one by one, we've died and I'm the last one here. And she would go on to beat breast cancer. But in 2018, she died from cancer in her spine and in her chest. And over the years, researchers and historians have suggested that their daily diet of pets formula led to poor health later in life.